Welcome back to my video series on partial differential equations. In this lesson, we're going to continue solving our fourth order PDE for the vibrating beam. We've resumed directly from where we left off in the last lesson, so I encourage you to refer to that video if you need to refresh your memory on how we got here. Recall that when we left off, we had left off at this point in solving our PDE with the u of x comma t given by this expression. Note that the constant beta is given by the ratio of omega to alpha, and omega is related to the separation constant we got when we were solving the vibrating beam problem via separation of variables. I'll call this equation 1. The big question now is how do we find these values of these constants from a to f? To answer this, I'm going to copy paste my PDE problem here with my fourth order differential equation and its boundary and initial conditions. We'll start by plugging in the boundary condition at x equals 0, where u is also 0. As a result, my equation 1 becomes the following. The hyperbolic sine and the simple sine of 0 are both 0, so the DNF terms cancel. In addition, the hyperbolic cosine of 0 and the regular cosine of 0 are both 1. So if we now simplify, this is what we'll get. Now this expression has to be zero regardless of the time, and of course, our time functions inside the first bracket can't always sum to zero for every single time point, unless of course a and b were both zero, in which case our solution would be trivial, it would be meaningless. As a result, in order for this product to be zero and our boundary condition to be satisfied for all possible values of time, we need c plus e to be zero. I'll call this equation two. The next thing we'll do is apply the second derivative boundary condition at x equals 0, where the second derivative of u and x is 0 at x equals 0. But to apply this boundary condition, we'll have to take the partial derivative of u in x twice. The first partial of u with respect to x is just our time function, which is basically a constant that can be taken outside when we take the partial derivative in x, times c times the square root of beta times the hyperbolic sine of square root of beta x, plus d square root of beta hyperbolic cosine of square root of beta x minus e square root of beta sine square root of beta x plus f square root of beta cosine square root of beta x. Remember that the derivative of hyperbolic cosine is hyperbolic sine and the derivative of hyperbolic sine is hyperbolic cosine. The second partial of u and x is therefore given by the following expression. Once again, the time function behaves as a constant when we take the partial in x, so we just have to differentiate the position function inside the square brackets. And so let's apply the boundary condition now by substituting x equals 0 into our second partial derivative in x and setting the left hand side to 0. Again, the sines, both the hyperbolic and the regular sines, become 0 and the cosines become 1. And when we simplify, this is then what we end up with. Of course, the beta is just a non-zero constant, so it would cancel from both sides. And again, the time function cannot always be 0, so that means the thing multiplying the time function has to be 0. As a result, c minus e must be 0, and so c equals e. I'll call this equation 3. Now since c and e are equal, if I plug my c back into equation 2, then that means 2e equals 0, and so e equals 0. And since c and e are equal, that means that c is also 0. And because c and e are both 0, this means that my equation for u simplifies to the following, this time with only the hyperbolic sign and the regular sign in the position part of the equation. Again, I've specified the definition of beta over here in this statement as the ratio of omega and alpha. The next thing we'll do is apply our boundary conditions at x equals l. So if we go back up, then we know that at x equals l, both the function u and its second partial in x are 0. If we now come back down, we'll substitute x equals l in both our u equation and in our second partial of u equation to get the following expressions. This for u and this for the second partial of u. And once again, the time terms aren't always guaranteed to be zero as long as we want a non-trivial solution, which leaves us with the following two equations involving the constants d and f. We can, of course, cancel the beta as well from the second equation and the second partial of u to get the following. And if we rearrange the second equation here, we'll find that the d times the hyperbolic sine term equals f times the regular sine term. If we now plug our f term as our d hyperbolic sine into the first equation, here's what we'll get. If this term is 0, then there's two possibilities. The first is that the square root of beta times l, the term inside the hyperbolic sine, is 0. And that's the only way we can make the hyperbolic sine 0. There are no other real numbers whose hyperbolic sine is 0 except for 0 itself. 
but this first possibility is not achievable because our beta is a non-zero constant and our L is also non-zero because it's a finite length. The second and only remaining possibility is that our D is zero, which pretty much has to be the case then, so we've eliminated our constant D also. And this means that we're left with the following equation involving the constant f, where f times the sine of L square root of beta is zero. Again, there's two possibilities whereby the left-hand side of this equation can be zero. The first is that f is zero, but if f were also zero, then our solution u becomes entirely trivial, which we don't want. The second possibility is that the sine of square root of beta L is zero. And this is possible as long as the argument of the sine, the square root of beta times L, is an integer multiple of pi. That's because the sine of an integer multiple of pi is zero, just like how sine of pi, sine of two pi, three pi, etc., they're all zero. This would translate to the square root of beta being the following, which means that beta would be n pi over L squared. Notice here that I've actually restricted myself to positive integers because beta cannot be zero. That's because in the last video we showed how the separation constant omega, which beta directly depends on, beta is omega over alpha, we showed how the separation constant omega is actually not allowed to be zero in order to have a physical solution. Now because beta is omega over alpha, this means that omega is given by alpha times n pi over l squared. And since n can be any positive integer, this means that beta and omega, which both depend on n, can take on multiple values. And because beta and omega can take on multiple values depending on the value of n that I pick, it's often useful to index beta and omega by the integer n that they correspond to. If we now substitute our beta n and omega n into our ultimate solution for the fourth order PDE, our u, this is what we get. Of course, I've gotten rid of the d term because d is zero, and I've also absorbed the constant f into the constants a and b to give me the lowercase constants a and b, the small a and the small b. Now, because beta and omega can take on multiple values according to the index n they correspond to, the same logic applies to the solution u, which means that I can also index this solution according to the integer n. And in general, my constants a and b also depend on this index n, so I can index those constants also. What this means is that for any positive integer n, u sub n will satisfy our vibrating beam PDE problem. And because there are so many of these u n's that satisfy the PDE problem, because there are so many infinitely many positive integers, I can write the most general possible solution to my PDE problem as a sum or linear combination of these individual u n's. Notice that I've substituted my omega n's and beta n's in terms of the integer n and the length of the beam L. And I'm going to call this equation 4. What remains now is finding the constants a n and b n. And how do we do that? Well, we use the two conditions that we still haven't used yet, our initial conditions. The first initial condition, recall, states that when t is 0, u is u naught of x. And when I apply this initial condition to equation 4, this is what I get. The sine term in time cancels, and so I end up with the sum over n of a n times sine of n pi x over l. How do I isolate my a n? Well, this is what I do. I multiply both sides by sine of m pi x over l, where m is another positive integer, which may or may not be equal to n. And then what I do is I integrate both sides from 0 to l. Since the integral of the sum of multiple functions is the sum of their integrals, we can switch the order of the integration and summation, in which case we can move the integral and sigma to different sides, and this is how we can simplify our expression to the following. Now look what happens when n doesn't equal m. Well, when n and m are both different, then the integral of the product of sine m pi x over l and n pi x over l is zero. We've discussed this already in previous videos, but this idea comes from the Sturm-Liouville theorem, which proves that these two sine functions are orthogonal. You could also just do the integral yourself and prove that it's zero when n doesn't equal m. The only time, however, when the right-hand side isn't zero is when n equals m, which means that every single term in the summation will cancel out except when n equals m. And this ends up hugely simplifying our equation so that now we have this. 
If we integrate the sine squared term on the right hand side, we end up with a n times l over 2 on that right hand side. And now if we isolate our coefficient a sub n, we get 2 over l times the integral from 0 to l of u naught of x times sine of n pi over l with respect to x. And I'll call this equation 5. But we're not quite done yet, because if I go up to my u in equation 4, I still need to determine the coefficients b sub n. And how do we determine those coefficients? Well, we use the second initial condition. And the second initial condition states that at time 0, the partial of u with respect to t is some function v naught of x. And let's apply this initial condition by taking the partial derivative of u with respect to time. And this partial derivative will turn out to be the following. When I apply my initial condition, here's what I get. The sine term cancels and the cosine term becomes 1, so I find that my v naught of x equals the following. I'm going to do the same thing I did last time, which is to multiply both sides by sine of m pi x over l, where m is some other positive integer, and then integrate both sides from 0 to l. Note that I've skipped a step here and already switched the order of the summation and integration on the right hand side because the integral of the sum is the sum of the integrals. Once more the right hand side integral is 0 for all values of m that are not equal to n, so we cancel every single term in the summation where m is not equal to n. If we now evaluate the integral on the right and isolate the expression for b sub n, this is what we end up with. And I will call this equation 6. And so finally, the solution to my fourth order PDE problem describing the vibrating beam with the homogeneous boundary conditions in U and the second partial of U is given by the following function of x and time, where the coefficients a sub n and b sub n are obtained from the initial conditions u naught of x and v naught of x and are given by the following integrals. And this is the general solution for our vibrating beam fourth order partial differential equation. So that's it. You've transcended the pool of scrubs and wannabe nerds and become the ultimate nerd by solving a fourth order partial differential equation. The next time you decide to wander into a party, please be sure to pull this stunt out as a party trick and please be sure to credit my channel when you solve a fourth order PDE right in front of everybody to assert your dominance. Anyway, that should do it for this lesson. I'd like to thank the following patrons for their support and if you enjoyed the video, feel free to like and subscribe. This is the Faculty of Khan signing out.